great comedians are often people who know great sorrow in their personal lives. One of the great comedians of our day is the former goon Michael Bentine, a strange vocation for a man who claims to have seen right into hell during the Second World War while he served with the Royal Air Force once they let him in. It took me 14 volunteerings to get into the RAF. And I only finally got in because I was arrested as a deserter. Oh, so, now tell us about that, because you were actually taken off the stage. But I, it was very strange, because uh, I hadn't been in. And I'd been trying to get in ever since 39. Tony, my brother, was in the HAC Honourable Artillery Company. And I was just about to go on stage in my doublet and hose. When was this Shakespeare? Shakespeare, yes. I was playing Lorenzo in The Merchant of Venice. And uh, this chap, the flat hat, came in and he said, uh, Mr. Michael Bentine. So I said, yes, thinking, oh, at last, you look great, wonderful. Mm -hmm. He said, you're 65 days adrift, uh, AWOL, you're a deserter. And Robert said, how can he be a deserter? He's trying to get in the RF, I'm trying to get out. And then this idiot said, take your sword, Fred, he might do yourself a mischief, <laughs> tin sword. And they wouldn't let me change in case I did a moonlight through the toilet window. <laughs> so with my with my trench coat over my shoulders and pulled up in the hose, I turned up at the DAPM's office, Deputy what? Assistant Provo Marshal, mm -hmm. and was put in a cell. So I reacted. I just clung onto the bars and said, John Abler, una palabra de inglés solamente castellano. He said, what did you say? I said, I don't speak any English. I only speak Castilian Spanish, which I spoke very badly. He said, you're bluffing. So I said, well, you, f <laughs> you find my papers if they're there. And he got the papers, and he said the immortal lines, God almighty, Fred, he really is a bloody wog, <laughs> which I have never forgotten. He's obviously in the diplomatic corner. And anyway, I was carted off, and, and uh, the uh, ambassador came, who was my godfather, one of uh, my proven godfather. Mm -hmm. And he said, que pasa, Miguel, so I told him. He was furious, and he said, not one British ship into the port of Callao will go until the honor of this young man has been vindicated. So they vindicated my honour, and the next thing I, I, I knew, I was, I was invited to meet A.A.H. Gilligan, the cricketer, my great hero, because I was cricketer. And he said, we're awfully sorry. We really aren't terribly sorry. He was then a group captain in charge of Air Crew Reception Centre, which is where I should have gone. And he said, uh, I said, one thing I must know, when you were at Eaton Way, well, try Bob, did I play cricket? I said, yes, sir. Bowler? So I said, yes, sir. What sort? I said, medium paced in swingers. He said, yes, can you bowl the Chinaman? I said, you mean the googly sayers, six times out of six. He said, we must have you in the RF. <laughs> now, I could have been Hitler's illegitimate son, so long as I was a medium paced in swing, I was in. And from then on, all the obstacles were removed and I was in the RF. Then they nearly killed me. They gave me an injection, a booster injection, before going to Canada. I think we must have been going to Canada because they they issued us with tropical kids. <laughs> that sounds right. To fool the Hun, you see. <laughs> and uh, we were lined up getting the jabs, the boosters. And I saw the medical orderly change the bottle. You see. And he gave the last three of us on the flight. And uh, within six hours, one was dead. Uh, I was in convulsions. And the other chap was paralyzed for life, more or less. Mm -hmm. He was invalided out. It took me six months to get back on my feet. I was blind for several weeks. And uh, then they said, well, I, I'm afraid that's the end of your aircrew training. And I said, well, that's Johnny. And I said, it took me 14 months to get in. Now you nearly killed me. Because I've always been under the impression that most of the medical officers were working for the Luftwaffe. <laughs> However, um, I said, well, can't I do something? And I said, wait a minute. You've got languages. So I said, yes, yes. Which one? Said, well, French and Spanish. They said, wonderful, and put me with the Poles. <laughs> so that was the start. And uh, I was commissioned at Cosford. And then I had that wonderful man, Airy Neve, gave us mm. the, um, the, uh, the intelligence course at uh, the Towers Highgate, where I met all sorts of strange people, including professional spies and amateur spies and resistance workers and, and all people who'd got out of the hands of, of the Nazis. And I, I, I learned to teach the techniques for evasion, because your chances of getting out if you were an escaper were pretty low. Erin Eve did a home run, as you know, from Colditz, uh, one of the very few people to get out of that Straflager. Uh, your biggest chance was if you could uh, hide up after you'd made the parachutage or the d'interrichage d'emergence, an emergency landing, and then hide in a wood, 
and then pick somebody who was isolated and go up to him and say, look, I'm a British airman and I need help. And, and uh, sometimes he just turned you straight in. But mainly, uh, especially if you were in Belgium or in France, the resistance was just wonderful. Let's talk about what happened after you left the Air Force and, and the birth of the goons. I mean, where, oh. where did the goons spring from? They sprang from the war. Uh, we were uh, six servicemen. There were really four, four, four goons, which was uh, uh, Harry and Spike and Peter and myself. And we'd all met through the windmill. Uh, the word goon comes from an Edgar Seagar cartoon. You know, he did the Popeye cartoons. Yes. And the goons were hairy creatures that talked in sound waves. And they were really ohm signs, you know, what no signs. Sign of an ohm. Yes. And uh, so we used the, the traditional goon voice, which is Goofy, which was Ralph Wright's voice from Walt Disney's Goofy. And oh, how the bell in the old towering. That type of voice. <laughs> and that became Eccles. And we, it really grew from having a lot of fun uh, after, after hours in the pub. Mm. And we got together, and a lovely man called Pat Dixon listened, uh, came down and listened to us and said, I think I'd make great radio. And he was the fostering father. The BBC hated us. Uh, one chap said to me, he said, I don't like the go-on show at all. <laughs> the go-on show? Yes, the, uh, the go-on show. He said, it's <laughs> iconoclastic, and it's disestablishmentarianism in its worst form. And he, he'd managed to dodge the column during, mm -hmm. the, during the war. It was at a time when you couldn't say ruddy on the air. I mean, you, I was up once for saying it. Murders in all directions. That was what it was all about. We were all ex-servicemen who couldn't believe we'd survived the war. And all that ebullience <clears throat> came from it. It was always very good-natured ebullience. And it was always against authority. But it wasn't hate-filled. It was filled with affection and love and, and uh, quite ridiculous. And I loved it. And I loved the people concerned. A lot of... Um kind of highbrow critics have since very solemnly read all sorts of abstract philosophizing into the thing, but in fact you were just having a good time. <laughs> the happiest times I think any of us had was really uh, in that, <laughs> um, as individual men, as, uh, as opposed to family men, something that our families might even have been slightly jealous of. Mm. The fact that we did have this extraordinary relationship of folly, and now we will meet and there's no formality. <laughs> hey, well, and we're off. And we, we're talking gibberish, but it's all mutually shared memories, all the madness. Mm -hmm. And especially the fact that we were them. It was, it was, it's us against them or them against us, whichever you like. Mm. It was a great experience. Good it, fun. It, it, is it too solemn to see some kind of connection between this ability to make people laugh, this desire to make people laugh, and... and what a Spanish philosopher called the tragic sense of life, because you've had that as well. well. Yes, we had quite a basin of that, haven't we? Yeah. Um, yes, my whole family's had that. No, I, I think by the time I was 24, I'd probably seen some of the most ghastly sights that anybody can ever experience, but then a lot of soldiers went through that, and airmen, mm -hmm. and uh, of course in the Navy and what have you, and in the Luftwaffe and the Russian army and everything else. Mm -hmm. Because it was an appalling war, it was a dreadful war. Um, I think it was a reaction against that. I think humour got us through it. Uh, I, I, was, I always remember we were getting a terrible stonk going up, getting you know stuff coming in, uh, going up through uh, through Germany, and I thought my last hour had come because I wasn't really trained for that. <laughs> I was trained for something else. And wriggling across the, the grass came uh, my Batman, who's an awfully nice chap called Albert, and he said, "I brought you a cup of tea, so I thought you might like." But there's all this hell going on in all directions, and I thought, now there's somebody that really should be given the reward of heaven. You know. yes. That's actually very British too. Yes. yes, I think the connection is that the reaction of humour is the defence mechanism against the, some of the appalling sides of life. Mm -hmm. You were at Belzend at the end of the war, weren't yes, you? Yes, I was. was I, I, after the war was over? Yes. Mm. No, well, no, it was still on. <laughs> it was still on when we liberated Belsen. Uh, we arrived at Sella. It must have been... Uh, Yes, pretty near the end of the war. We were operating there for about a fortnight when the ceasefire came through at about 1 a.m. in the morning. And uh, uh, we'd been there about 24 hours, no longer than that. And while we were there, this jock doctor came down the road and he said, has anybody got any medical knowledge? And I had a bit of St. John's ambulance training in which I nearly killed an admiral. And I said, well, I'm willing to you know, help. And we went up the road and he was very silent. And I thought, oh, dear, this chap's in shock, you know. And uh, 
course, when I saw it, I knew why. Mm. I looked upon the open face of hell. I, I've never. But had so you sensed its presence? Wasn't there an occasion when you were lost and you somehow? No, that was many years later. As many years later. But I mean, you could feel something awful odd. Mm. But then you see, you were surrounded by death. I'd been surrounded by death since the Rhine crossing. I'd been I'd been in uh, death situations many times during the war. But I had never seen it all mass. Mm -hmm. yes, now, really well, one of the things that must have been particularly difficult for you is that you are psychic and were throughout this mm. horrid human conflict. Mm. And so you, you must have been more sensitive to impending tragedy, probably even precognizing things yes, on I, occasions. I think most children can do that. I think it's why children are so immensely sensitive. It's really, once again, the survival antennae coming out. I think most children have it. I think it's kicked out of them. With my father, it was encouraged with me. He developed it. I was one of his guinea pigs.